Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this event. Lovely to have you online today here with us. A warm welcome to those joining us for this first online event by the UCT UK Young Alumni Network. My name is Capucine, a founding member of the network and your host this evening. By way of background, for those that are less familiar with the Young Alumni Network, it was established in 2019 with its mission to nurture the growth of a young UCT alumni community in the UK and with the aim of both empowering our members as talented individuals and UCT as a lead in Af leading African university. Over the past two years, we have seen an increase in appetite for such a network, bringing together young UCT alumni from all professional backgrounds and perspectives who are keen to support the VC's vision. The VC's vision is based on three pillars, that of excellence, transformation and sustainability. And what binds these three pillars together is strong and effective leadership. We thought it fitting, therefore, to focus this evening on the theme of leadership and our individual responsibility to be leaders in the spaces we operate in. To begin with, I will be introducing our guest speaker, Kristen Ransom, a formidable young woman and fellow UCT alumni. Kristen will then be guiding us through a conversation on how we might better understand what matters to us as individuals, how to effectively craft a vision for our lives and how best to communicate that vision to those around us in a way that inspires change. The session will cover core topics that are of emotional intelligence, specifically focusing on the role of compassion in effective leadership and on how compassion can be used as a strategic tool to inspire change. We will finish by opening the floor for Q&A. There is a live Q&A feature which we encourage you to make use of. And so please do feel free throughout the event to submit your questions and we will get to a point where we will be able to address them. We definitely would like to make this event as interactive and as engaging as possible. And so don't be shy, please do submit your questions. This event is always also being recorded, which is helpful if you wish to rewatch it or perhaps share it with friends and family. So a bit more about Kristen. Since graduating from UCT in 2016, Kristen has completed her master's degree, worked for one of South Africa's fastest growing startups, and is now based in Dublin, where she works at Google in the Sub-Saharan African team. Kristen is also a podcast host to a show called Connection Academy, a series of conversations which discuss what success might look like in a truly connected world. One where we have a better understanding of ourselves each other and the endless possibilities of life around us. Kristen believes that purpose can be found when we invest our energy into things we believe matter to ourselves, others and society at large. She believes that every person has something to contribute and that through compassionate leadership, we can best extract the value of every individual around us. Kristen, turning to you now, you have titled today's event as Redefining Success and Leading with Compassion. Can you share a bit more about what this means to you? Over to you. Thanks so much, Capucine. Um, firstly, just wanted to say thanks for hosting this event and for asking me to speak and share about a passion, a very passionate topic that's very, very close to my heart. And thank you to the UCT UK alumni for just creating this space for us to connect and share with each other in our community. So yeah, the talk today, uh, redefining success and leading with compassion. This means a lot to me and I'd like to break it into two parts. So what do I mean when we talk about redefining success? So as Capucine already mentioned, I believe that every single person has something to contribute and that it is our individual responsibility to take the time to learn about what that is for us, to know what matters to us and what we value, and to define success in our lives based on what comes up. If we look back into previous generations, success was largely and has largely been about economic growth and prosperity, which has gotten us really far. But I firmly believe that we need to change our mindsets from having more to being more. And that's largely what we're going to cover today when we talk about redefining success. Secondly, we're going to speak about leading with compassion. And here I'm going to go 
in, in quite in depth in terms of what does it look like to use empathy as a strategic communication tool, one which you can use to really get people to understand your vision, to feel with your vision, but most importantly, to take action on your vision. So that's what I'll be sharing with you today. Thanks, thanks, Kavitin. Back over to you. Thank you, Kristen. That sounds really exciting. Look forward to it. And so my question then is, what are you hoping for people to leave here with today? I mean, maybe you can share a bit more about that and then go into your main message for us. Over to you now. Great. Um, yes, so what I'm hoping to, to help people leave here with today would be two things. I'm really hoping that everyone can challenge themselves, have the courage to go deeper and to really look inside and search inside yourself and answer some of the tough questions I'm going to ask you today. That would be the first thing, to challenge yourself. And the second thing would be to inspire you. I'm really hoping to inspire you, to show you the endless possibilities that life holds for each and every single one of us to create and share a life that we are really proud of and that we love. So to challenge and inspire. There's, there's a quite a nice quote that I saw and it said, once we come to reveal the best parts of ourselves, by nature, we become a force for good. And really to kick us off today, I'd like to take three minutes to go through a video. Um, and while you're watching this video, I'll challenge each of you to really try and relax, try to get out of your heads and out of your thoughts and to really try and feel with the message that is being shared. So let's take three minutes and just go through this video together. So if you're feeling anything like me, there was quite a few big questions that came up in that video. And I think that the world would be a fundamentally better place if more of us took the time to answer those questions. What is it that we value? What are we passionate about? Where would we like to add value in the lives of others? And do we really care? 
Now, I'm aware that these are big questions. They're difficult to answer. And one of the main reasons why they're difficult to answer is because in very few schooling systems are we really taught how to use our emotional intelligence. I think we've been taught over and over again the power of intellect and how to master our minds. But what might it mean to get go deeper and to really be vulnerable with yourself and search inside to uncover some of these really important questions and the answers therein? So what I'm going to do next, we're going to share a link on the chat. Um, what we're going to do is try and answer this question of what really matters to you. I'd love to just get a feel for what's in the room or what's in the, this event of who's listening of what came up for you when you were watching this video. It is an anonymous um, answer, so there will be no names that are popping up. It will just be a great way for us to get an understanding of what you are all feeling. And the question that I'm going to ask you to answer reads as this. Looking back at the end of your life, what would make you most proud of the life that you have lived? And I'll try to take a few moments before writing down your answers. You will be able to put multiple answers there. And really try to go deeper with yourself and tap into what you would be feeling on the last day of your life about what would make you proud of the life that you have lived. And I'm going to give you a minute here to fill out your answers. another 30 seconds or so to complete this. For those who are still filling in their answers, that's fine. I'm just going to carry on sharing in the meantime. I'm really inspired to see some of the answers that have come up here. Um, there's quite a few that speak about love, being loved and giving love, um, making others happy, being the best dad ever, being a great mom, having successful, happy children that's come up, having no regrets, having achievements. Now, I'd like each of you to really focus on what you typed that is showing here. Um, and also have a look at what other people have shared to just gain inspiration from this. Now, why I'm starting off with this exercise is because how life goes is it is so easy after school and once you start working to just hop on the hamster wheel of life and run as fast as you can and to lose the answer to this question. All of a sudden you can blink um, and you're having a midlife crisis perhaps and you're feeling like you haven't lived a life that you're proud of or perhaps you have but you're not aware of what you have in fact done um, that's given you that sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment. I'd also just like to point out that no one has put here their career. Um, I know some people have put achievements, some have put academic studies. There's nothing really about titles there's nothing showing anything materialistic. It's much more about how you might feel. It's about loyalty, love, family, and being good to others. And that's really about what we're going to be tapping into today. So thanks everyone for sharing on that. I really appreciate um, the courage that it took to just share what was on your mind and on your heart. So what I'm going to do is introduce myself based on what matters to me. Um, so, as Kathy Seen said earlier, I'm Kristen Ransom, and when I ask myself, at the end of my life, what would I be proud of about the life that I have lived? This answer make, manifests in many different ways, 
But one of the main things that comes up is that I would have helped people find connection in their lives to themselves, each other, and the many perspectives beyond their own. And now that I've taken the time to become aware that this is the one main thing that matters to me, I have intentionally been able to weave this into every single thing that I do, whether it's my work, whether it's my side work that I'm doing with my podcast, or how I show up in my relationships with my family and my friends, and most importantly, with strangers. So I'd just like to break this up a little further. What does it mean to have connection with yourself or self-awareness? I think that this is probably the most important thing that we should all have, but often don't. We're not taught this in school. And without self-awareness, life ends up happening to you, not for you. I like to think about self-awareness as turning the lights on in your life. Now, just imagine the scene. I'm sure many of you have been there. You come home at night, you unlock your front door, and you're walking down your passage, perhaps to your bedroom, and it's dark. And you think to yourself, oh, I'm not going to bother turning on the lights. I'll just make my way to the room. So you stumble down the passage. Maybe you stub your toe. You might bump into your cat, who's then very unhappy with you. And you eventually get to your room, and you make it there, and you turn on the light. And you think, oh, well, that was fine. Self-awareness is largely the same. Without it, you can get through life, you can achieve a lot, you can have a successful career, you can have a marriage, a family, a great house, and all the things that people have told us are what we deem successful. But without turning the lights on and having self-awareness, we are stumbling in the dark. We don't have the ability, firstly, to look back over our shoulders and learn from the path that we have already taken. And further, we don't have the ability to look forward and be intentional and strategic about the journey we might be embarking on. So this is self-awareness. Next, I try to help people have connection to each other. And another way of saying this would maybe be social awareness. This ultimately means that we would have the ability to build and maintain sustainable relationships. One where we have a much better understanding of what other people think and what other people feel and how we can conduct ourselves around them in such a way that both parties feel seen, heard and valued. Much easier said than done and much of the problems or many of the problems that exist in the world are because we don't take the time and we don't have the skill set needed to have the right level of empathy to actually connect with one another. And lastly, and probably most importantly, and most difficult, is to have connection to perspectives beyond our own. With our perspectives beyond our own current reality, it's really difficult to take into consideration some of the really challenging issues that exist in the world today. To mention a few, the ongoing racial injustice and inequality that happens on a global level, the severely dividing political views, or the devastating impact of climate change. Now, why I'm really inspired to be speaking to all of you today is that we are all incredibly privileged to be alumni of the university and especially a university in Africa. And I think it's our responsibility to really lean into each of these three things, self-awareness, awareness of others and awareness of perspectives beyond our own so that really we can have a, an honest and open view of our world and what our responsibility is to add value therein. So with that being said, this is what we're going to be speaking about today. I'm hoping to help you get a much better understanding of what matters to you holistically and how you can get those around you to care. So we'll be going through the following five lessons and I'm quickly going to summarize them. Number one is to become a student. And this is really about separating yourself from your ego and acknowledging that you always have more to learn, no matter who you are. And what we're going to spend time on here is reflecting on people that you might consider to be your role models and why and what you aspire or appreciate about them. Next, we'll be looking at living a life with purpose and not passion. 
And this is really all about considering and defining what we uh, define as happiness and comparing a life rooted in happiness and joy and the pursuit thereof or a life rooted in our deeper most value systems. Next, we'll be looking at what it might mean to take responsibility for our lives. And this is all about identifying and taking action on things that matter to us, having the courage to express outwardly what we have come to see and feel inwardly. Number four would be to live and breathe your vision. And here we will be chatting about the art of navigating between how things are versus how things ought to be and the burden and opportunity of leadership to challenge the status quo. And lastly, and I think most importantly, what it means to lead with compassion. And this is where we're going to go into how empathy can be used as a strategic communication tool, whether that be in your personal life or your professional life, or even how you conduct yourself in your community. So this is what we're going to be going through today. I hope you are all already buckled in somewhere comfortable. It is quite late. Um, so pick up your glass of wine, maybe a cup of tea, and let's get straight into it. So lesson number one is all about becoming a student. And a quote that I really like is, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So let me explain what this means to me. When I was doing my master's degree through the University of Cape Town, I was studying marketing research in behavioral science. And I read a quote that said, research is formalized curiosity. And when I reflected on that, I just thought, wow, the answers to most of the world's problems are out there. And through curiosity, we can find the information to solve those problems and join the dots in an effective way. And this to me is what sparked my motivation to continue with my master's and pour myself into it and really pour myself into continued research after my academic studies and in my job and my life at large. And I think the most important thing that we all need to be most curious of, there is a huge list and we're going to go through much of it today, but where we should start is by studying our personal values and finding people who might be able to help and guide and steer us to be on the right path. Now, when we asked, what are your values? It's a really difficult question to answer. And why that is, is because your values are not rooted in your intellectual mind. So when you try to answer straight off the bat, What's happening is that you're trying to answer with your intellectual mind and what you actually need to do is slow down, take a moment to pause and reflect on what you're feeling and to tap into those emotions, to tap into your intuition, because that is where your value system lies. So how do we practically do this? I'm going to take you through an exercise. We won't have the time to do the full thing now, but I'm going to walk you through exactly what you can do in your own time to become aware of what your values are. Because only once you are aware of your values, can you live a life that is in alignment with them. So the first question, who do you admire? Now you can bring somebody to mind from your personal life, your career, your spiritual life, somebody in your society, and really ask yourself, what is it that I admire about this person? What specific qualities do I look up to in this person? This is a really powerful way of becoming aware of our values, because often the people that we admire most or our role models have characteristics and qualities that we wish to emulate in ourselves. So that would be the first question. Next, what inspires you to take action? Now, this is another powerful way to understand your values. Think of a time where you stood up for something. Perhaps back in primary school, one of your friends was being bullied in the playground and something just came over you and you decided to stand up and say, this is not right, this is not okay. Perhaps it was in a meeting and your manager presented a strategy that he thinks he or she thinks the team should proceed with. Um, and you disagreed with it and you, without a second's thought, you put your hand up and shared your views. Whatever the situation is for you, 
really tap into what you felt in that moment that got you to take action. And um, what motivated you? You know, the answer to this question helps you identify your internal motivation. And once you become aware of what internally motivates you, you don't need somebody else dangling a carrot in front of you to get you to move. You can get yourself to move and you can point yourself in directions that, you know, that really matter to you. So that would be what inspires you to take action. And the last question here, when do you feel most like yourself? Now, it just makes me happy to even think about answering this question. And, and I'm sure and I hope that it brings up warm feelings for each of you. But think about the types of people you're around when you feel most like yourself or the types of environments you're in, the conversations you're having, the tasks you're doing. Where do you really connect with your most authentic self? Now, when we feel like we are living an authentic life, that is because we are in alignment with our values. And this question helps us understand what we value and where we show up in places with our values. Now, each of these three questions, to do them justice, I would um, suggest you take 20 to 30 minutes per question. Um, write, make a big brainstorm, get out colored pens and do your thing and really unpack what comes up for you with each of these questions. You need to give it the right amount of time. If you try and rush through this exercise in five minutes, you're not going to be answering from your heart, you're going to be answering from your mind. Once you've written out all of your pages, get a different color pen, circle things that have common themes. And through doing this exercise, this is what enables you to identify your values. When I did this, I noticed that a lot of things that were coming up for me, whether it was people, things that I was feeling really engaged in, or um, times where I'd really taken, um, taken up the, you know, the opportunity to stand up. Things that came up were, were, were values such as leadership, responsibility, courage, creativity. These are all of my values. And it's a, it's a really useful exercise to come to understand what really matters to you. Now, Throughout today, I'm going to be sharing some of my role models um, who have really shaped my thoughts and ideas and have inspired a lot of my perspectives, specifically on the topic I'm sharing with you today. Um, and the first person I'd like to speak about is Stephen Covey, who is the author of the very well-known book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. An incredible book. I've read it about three times. I would highly, highly recommend it. He says that Innovation comes when we give people a purpose and make them feel valued. Now, firstly, we need innovation in the world that we live in. If we continue to do things the way that we are doing them, we are destroying our planet and we are not connecting with each other. We are going in separate directions. So we, are, we need innovation. We need new ways of thinking. So what does it mean to give somebody a purpose and to make them feel valued? So we've just done an exercise to understand what we value. And I believe that purpose comes when we've done work that we believe matters. So let me give an example. I know that one of my colleagues values creativity. So for the end of our, our end of year function, I can give that specific colleague the task of planning our creative design of our whole event. And they will absolutely love it and thrive because that's something that they value and if I've given them a task there, they feel valued because they feel seen, heard and respected in something that they love. Stephen Covey also says that leadership is about coming to communicate someone's worth and potential so clearly that they come to see it in themselves. Super powerful. But what I'm most passionate about is asking what would it take for us to be self leaders, to come to know our own worth and potential so clearly that we come to believe it in ourselves and as a result we have the courage to express it in our day-to-day -day lives. Not all of us have the opportunity to have fantastic mentors in our lives but every single one of us have the opportunity to invest time and energy back into ourselves and to become more aware of what sets us on fire on the inside and where we want to add the most value of our lives. So that's my first role model. Stephen Covey. 
So we'll move on to our second lesson, and this is to live with purpose and not passion. And this is really about instead of asking what makes you happy and following your passion, ask yourself what you deeply care about. Now, the quote, follow your passion. I'm sure so many of you, like myself, have been told that. And in fact, I've been a huge advocate of that my whole life. Um, but if you really look into this, it's actually been quite a criticized view and for good reason, which I'm going to go through shortly. When we talk about passion, we're largely talking about things that make us happy. Um, and I can't help but feel that so many people spend their lives chasing happiness without really defining what happiness means for them. And that's what we're going to do next. So we're going to post another link in the chat, exactly the same process as last time. Your answers will be anonymous. And I'd love to get a feel for you for this, of what comes up for this question. In one word, what do you think would make you happy? Once again, take some time to reflect and pause here before writing down your answer. I'll give you about a minute here. Okay, so feel free to keep the answers coming through. There's absolutely no judgment in any answer that comes up. That's the first thing I want to say. We are all individuals and we all have the full right to define what, what, we, what we find happiness in. Um, I'm inspired to see that the, the most popular thing that has come up there is love, followed by family. There's a few people that have put money. There's quite a few that have put making others happy. It's recognition graduating, health, and we'll see what else comes up. Now, whatever it is that you put down, I'd like you to, to, to really take a moment and focus on that word that you see on the screen. And also just take a look at what other people put. Now, as I was saying previously, so many people, when you ask them what they want out of their lives, or another way of framing this is, what, what, would, what do you want for your children? And so many people say, no, I just want to be happy. Or I just want my child to be happy. I just want my friend to be happy. But never mind other people. When, when we are chasing happiness, it's really important to know what happiness actually means to us. If you haven't taken the time to define that, it's like you're chasing your tail. You could actually have a life that has every single thing that you could even, ever fathom or dream of that to make you happy. But if you haven't taken the time to really pause and reflect and acknowledge this, you're blind to it and you'll always, always be searching. I see a few more people have put fulfilling purpose, recognition, and a few others. But thanks, thanks again to everyone for fulfilling out your responses here. So let's go a bit more in depth in terms of what research has defined happiness as. And I'm sure that Many of you may have read articles and seen different views on this, but this is one that has come up in a few different talks that I've been in. What we're looking at here is what percentage of happiness is in our control and what percentage of happiness is not in our control. Now, we know what is the point in focusing and stressing on things that are not in our control. We know that intellectually, but emotionally we often forget that. 
So I'm hoping to emotionally remind you of what you actually can manage and control when it comes to your happiness. So let's start off. 10% of our happiness is due to our life circumstances. 10%. Now that is a number that firstly we often overinflate. We think, you know what, maybe if I moved country, I would be happier. Maybe if I got a new car, maybe if I got that promotion. Whatever it might be for you, know that it is only 10% of your happiness. And it's really important then, sure, focus on those things, but it's really important to look at the remaining percentage of what constitutes our happiness. 50% of our happiness is due to our genetics. Some people are born to be more hardwired to experience positive emotion than others. So that's 50%. The remaining 40% is what is in our control. And that is dependent on what you think and do. Or in other words, happiness is dependent on your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. That is what we can control. Every single one of those are based on our emotions and our attitude that we have to life. And that is fully in our control. Doesn't mean that it's easy, but it's something that we can nurture and be proactive about and what we're going to spend quite a bit of time on in the remainder of today's talk. So let's go back to the question which said, we should really live a life based on purpose and not passion. Now, I didn't really understand that when I first saw it, so let me unpack that further. What do we mean when we speak about a life rooted in purpose? This is all about saying what matters to us, what are our deepest values, and how can we orientate our entire life around that? When you live a life based on what matters to you on a much deeper level, you develop the resilience to show up in situations that are not always easy. Standing up to that bully in the playground is not easy. Standing up to your boss who's presenting a strategy you disagree with is not easy. But when you do it anyway, because you know that it is right in your heart, you end up living a much more expansive, impactful, and valuable life. And no matter what is happening in your external environment, you're always fully in control of your values and showing up in a way that reflects them. And this is what it means to live a life with purpose. I'll pause there. Go back to that exercise where we looked at who do you admire, where do you feel most like yourself, and what uh, when, when were times that you were compelled to take action and really look at what comes up there? The answers there will help you see where you should root your life because those will be your values. OK, so on the contrast to that, what does it live to live a life rooted in passion? What does it mean to live a life rooted in passion rather? And when we speak about passion, we're really speaking about what brings us a sense of happiness, joy, and fulfillment. And passion is a great thing. I think being passionate and being aware of your passions and really intentionally investing time into them is a brilliant thing. But let's take a look at what happens when we orientate our whole life around passion. So looking at that shape there on the right, think back to when you were five years old and maybe one of your parents gave you an ice cream very small thing, but it made you feel a sense of ecstasy for the rest of the day. It didn't take much to, to disturb our level of happiness. Now, as you grow older and stress sets in, life responsibilities set in, things get harder, things get tougher. We have less time for ourselves. Naturally, our passions often fall to the wayside. When we live a life of passion, we have this illusion that things should all be sunshine and roses, because passion is when we're feeling sunshiny. It's when we're feeling really on top of the world. And as we all know, life is not all about being on top of the world. Life is a series of dualities between experiencing the highs and being grateful for them, and also experiencing the lows and learning from them. It's not about running away from the lows. It's part of life. And when we live a life of purpose over passion, we develop, we develop the level of resilience needed to maintain the lows and actually learn from them, taking us up to higher highs 
when we come out of them. So this is what we mean when we speak about living a life of purpose over passion. If you really want this for yourself, you need to invest the time. You need to do the exercises, find what you value and really be intentional about reflecting and baking that into your day to day. Another role model of mine is Tony Robbins. He is quite a famous life coach and business strategist, and he inspires people all over the world with his amazing positive energy. And something that he says is that it's not leadership by position that allow people to succeed. It's the capacity to influence the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, and the actions of other human beings. Now, we just learned that 40% of our happiness is based on thoughts, feelings, and actions. And what Tony Robbins is saying is that leadership is our ability to influence those same variables. Never mind leading other people, we can think about that later. Think about leading yourself and influencing your thoughts, feelings, and actions, and what that would mean for you based on the journey that you are on. Lesson number three, take responsibility for your life. This is about having the level of self-awareness and courage to lead from your heart, the courage to express outwardly what you come to value and feel inwardly. It takes so much courage to do that and to show up authentically and with integrity. But this is what is needed for us to each take responsibility for our lives. Huge role model of mine, Jordan B. Peterson. He is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology and also author of the book 12 Rules for Life. You can look him up on YouTube and listen to some of his really incredibly inspiring talks. And he says that the secret to your existence is right in front of you and it manifests itself in all the things you should do that you're avoiding. So ask yourself, what things do I know that I should do that I'm not doing because I'm not showing up with integrity? What things do I know that I should do but I'm not doing because I'm not showing up with integrity? And why I added that last sentence about integrity is because integrity is about doing what is right over what is fun, fast, or easy. It is not easy to live a life with integrity when much of our world is based on what is fun, fast, and easy. Those three things sell. Those three things make you cool. Those three things might get you a promotion and see you have to have great success based on how the world currently defines success. But often those three things clash with what is right. And I really think that each of us have the responsibility to challenge that in our day to day. It doesn't have to be in your career. Start small, start where you can. Look at your friendship circle. What might be happening in that space that is fun, fast or easy, but not right? And what responsibility and opportunity do you have to challenge that with compassion? And really to ask people, you know, is this the way that we should be showing up in this space? Or what, you know, what might think, what, how might this uh, situation um, evolve if we had to do things differently? Have the courage to look at things differently and to challenge the way things are being done around you. So what I'm going to do now is, if we had to try and define what success might look like going forward and what our responsibility is as leaders to get to that point of success. Let's look back at over time at where we've come from and how where we have come from as a has aided where we currently are and our responsibility to maximize all that we have to have the most value with our lives. So a really powerful book that I've read is called The Purpose Economy by Aaron Hurst. And he really goes back in time and looks at the different economic evolutions that have taken place and, and how each one of these evolutions has changed and shaped the way people produce output, but more so how we have harnessed our energy as, as a human race, 
how have how has our energy moved from physical intelligence to intellectual intelligence to emotional intelligence and what has changed in our external environment to allow such a movement so i might be sounding like i'm speaking gibberish to some people so let's go a little bit more in depth and not so academic Let's go back to the hunter-gatherer age, which is that person there who has a spear over their shoulder. One unit of human energy resulted in one unit of gain. Hunter-gatherers had to spend incredible amounts of time and energy out trying to get food for themselves and their families. They did not have much time or energy left to invest in their intellectual capacities, never mind their emotional capacities. And their success was largely dependent on their physical state. Now, they evolved from that into, or I should say, we evolved from that into the agricultural age, where we learned how to better harvest our lands. Instead of spending the whole day to get one animal to feed my one family, I can spend my day harvesting my field to feed 50 families. And each one of those 50 families is now saved the time and energy of spending their, their days hunting. They can now go and invest their time and energy learning of how to do things differently and how to have a better standard of life. And the same process has happened throughout subsequent ages. We then created machinery, which enabled us to have less time spent on manual labor and more time spent on intellectual tasks. And from there, we grew into the information age, where we then spent our increased intellectual energy and we invested it to build information technology and information technology has done an amazing thing it solves so many problems that human intelligence or intellect had to spend hours and hours years and decades to solve previously which is a beautiful amazing thing we have to ask ourselves what has success meant in all of these previous generations? And what does success mean for us now? I haven't touched on the last person in the line here on the far right hand side. Um, they're holding a, a tray with paint and a paintbrush and they are singing. And what Aaron Hurst says is that after the information age is the purpose economy, where we no longer have to govern our world with IQ, we can now start to leverage and lean into our EQ, our emotional intelligence, because a lot of the problems that our IQ was required for are now being solved by artificial intelligence, which I know a lot of people have their reservations about. But, and we won't go down that road today, but that's an incredible thing. Information technology has enabled us to learn more about ourselves than we ever have in previous times. It is a, an incredible thing. I love the quote that says, leadership is the highest of the arts because it enables all other artists to perform. Now, if we're looking at this evolution that we see and we're really trying to get as many people to the far right as possible, as many people to lean into their emotional capacities, their creativity, what makes them unique, what they value, what they care about, have the courage to express that and really show up with, with authenticity. How do we get them there? We need leaders who enable artists to perform. And every single person is an artist. A lawyer is an artist. Somebody working in climate change is an artist. Somebody in sales is an artist. We each have our own art form. And it is up to us to become immersed in that and share it with the world around us. And we can best do that when we're doing work that we deeply care about and is aligned to our personal values. And this is what, mean, what it means when we speak about the purpose economy and our role as leaders to get more people on board with this change. We need to stop dictating success or defining success as having more and look into what it would mean to be more. Each of these previous ages was, was uh, you know, seeing success based on economic growth, prosperity, and really having more output. And that wasn't a bad thing. But we really need to say, is success of the past going to be success of the future? And when we look at the fact that, you know, Jane, Jane Goodall 
said in her Davos 2020 talk, how is it that the world's most intelligent being is destroying its only home? Are we investing our intelligence right if this is the fact? We are destroying our only home. And I'm just touching on one topic here, which is climate change. We really need to challenge how we are defining success. And if we are having the courage to take responsibility on the issues that matter. So we've spent a bit of time looking back. Um, now what we're wanting to do is to look forward and to really set a vision for what success means to us. And this is lesson four, which is to live and breathe your vision. And this is all about having the courage to stand alone. It is the art of navigating between how things are versus how things ought to be. So let's look at how things are. And I'm going to echo some of the points I just looked at through those different economic evolutions. So over the course of history, while humanity has been on the planet, we have learned a great deal and we've harvested so much and we've gotten great outputs and seen tremendous growth. We learned how to harvest our lands and grow our own food and get greater prosperity. We learned to create machinery that enabled us to less, spend less time on manual tasks. We created information technology, which enabled us to solve some of the world's toughest intellectual problems. And we define success on having more. And this has been a great thing for humanity. We have an incredibly high standard of living compared to previous times. But I think it's our responsibility to look at this and say, what would it mean to add to this perspective, not to take from it, to add to it, and to say, what would it mean to be more, not to have more? And why I've put all of these into one circle is it's not that having more in and of itself is bad, but when we neglect being more, having more, it becomes dangerous and there's always an imbalance. Too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. We're told that from a very young age when we eat too many sweets. It's exactly the same logic here. We need to redefine success. So what does it mean to be more? And this is where we navigate to how things ought to be. Now, being more to me is rooted in those three things that I care about. Having a sense of connection with ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Now, I mentioned earlier that it takes courage to set a vision. And I want to explain that. If you're going to challenge the status quo and leave a space which is comfortable, a space which is familiar, a space which is known, a space where you are praised for all that you know, all that you have, the wealth that you've gained, the money that you have, the titles you have, you have to have courage to leave that space and to challenge the status quo. You have to leave, ask and seek new perspectives, look them in the eye, and then have the courage to bring them back and to potentially shake the ground that people stand on, the ground that many of us so desperately cling our identities and self-worth to. That takes huge courage. You need to have commitment. If you are to set a vision for yourself, it's not going to be easy. You have to really believe it in the depths of your heart and show up every day with commitment to that vision. And because it's not going to be easy, you need resilience. When you bring your vision back into a space of how things are, you're going to challenge people. You're going to potentially make them feel small or threatened. You're going to shake the ground that they stand on. And as a result, you're going to get feedback, a lot of which might be negative. Um, you might face rejection, criticism, and you need to be okay with this. In fact, you need to embrace it. You need to know that success does not fall out of the sky. Success is largely about embracing fear and failure and knowing that the accumulation of those things is what leads to the achievement of a brilliant goal and vision. And lastly, patience. Now, this is something I've learned through working in sales. 
you might deal with the haters, you might deal with the naysayers and eventually get them on board with your vision and they're nodding their heads in agreement saying, yeah, no, I agree with that, that makes sense. It's not going to happen overnight. You then need to take the next actions and really nurture them. Great, we all on board, who's doing what? And this is where you go back and say, how can I give everyone in this team a sense of purpose and connect this, this work and this vision of mine with their vision and their values? And therein lies the challenge and it requires incredible patience. But I hope that so far through everything I've said, you feel inspired to take on this challenge and to take responsibility for shaking up the ground that we stand on and to help us from having more to being more and to really leverage these emotional skills of courage, commitment, resilience and patience to redefine success in the future ages. I love this quote by Denzel Washington, and it says, to get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Now, to me, we largely haven't had much self-awareness or the awareness of others or the awareness of the world around us. And this is being reflected in those complex problems I mentioned earlier on. Racial injustice, that has been going on for decades. Dividing political views devastating effects of climate change. Each one of those is linked to awareness of self, awareness of others and awareness of the world around us. And it really is our responsibility to lean into those spaces and ask the uncomfortable questions and bring the hard truths back to our communities, our friends, our families and our communities at large. And really to me, this is what it means to be a daring, brave, brave leader. Another role model, model of mine is Yuval Noah Harari. Um, he is the author of a couple of books, to name a few, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21 Questions for the 21st Century. He, has, he is an incredibly inspiring person who has a wealth of knowledge of the history and the potential future of humanity. And he says, to keep up with the world of 2050, you need to do more than merely invent new ideas and products but above all, to reinvent yourself again and again. This is exactly what I mean when I say it's no longer about having more with new ideas and new products. It's about being more. It's about reinventing yourself, making sure that you can align so deeply with your own internal values that in a world that is constantly seeing so much change externally, you're going to be fine because you can reinvent yourself and show up no matter what the situation. All right, we're on to our last lesson of today, and this is to lead with compassion. Oprah Winfrey, who is also an incredible role model, has said that leadership is about empathy. In fact, a lot of people use those two words interchangeably. It is about having the ability to relate to and connect with people for the purpose of inspiring and empowering their lives. So what we're really going to look at now is what, what would it look like to use empathy as a strategic communication tool to get people to understand your vision, to feel with your vision and to feel compelled to take action on your vision. Earlier I was speaking about the patience, it, patience required to, to navigate between how things are versus how things ought to be. Compassion is the tool that we really need when we are applying patience. We need people to understand, to feel with and to take action. And each of those three things requires our time and our patience. So let's go through a practical exercise. And this is our last step of today of how we can lead with compassion. Another role model, Brene Brown, incredible. She's a professor, lecturer and author, and she has specialized in courage, vulnerability, shame and empathy. And she says, we desperately need more leaders who are committed to courageous, wholehearted leadership and who are self-aware enough to lead from their hearts rather than unevolved leaders who lead from hurt and fear. To lead from your heart means that you are leading from your value system. Not what you've been told is right, not what you've been told is success. 
what what you value that's and that takes courage she also says rather than unevolved leaders i've just spoken about the evolution that we have gone through we need to stop looking at having more and look at being more and have the courage to lean into that space. So what we've learned so far, self-leadership means understanding and taking responsibility for our thoughts, feelings and actions. Leading others refers to our capacity to influence others' thoughts, feelings and actions. And 40% of our happiness is determined by our thoughts, feelings and actions. So what stands out here? Thoughts, feelings, and actions. And this is where we're going to look at using empathy as a strategic tool to influence each one of these things. So let's start with thoughts. Um, this is always the best place to start because it is not personal. No one gets offended. It doesn't require all too much courage to apply cognitive empathy, which is our ability to understand how a person feels and what they might be thinking. It's not about agreeing with somebody. It's about understanding. You do not have to agree with somebody to respect them. You just need to understand. And all you need to do to understand is look at what, you know, what information is this person presenting to me through their also through their nonverbal communication. How are they sitting? Are they holding eye contact with me? Do they feel comfortable? Are they on board? Cognitive empathy makes us better communicators because it helps us relay information in a way that best reaches the other person. If you present something and I'm sitting there with my arms closed looking out the window, is your presentation likely to have had an impact on me? I might nod and say, well done, you did great. My body language is communicating absolutely not. And without cognitive empathy, you might miss you might miss that. And you might walk out of that office with your ego pushing you out, saying, Great, you did such a great job. That presentation went well, you got the nod of approval. Nothing's gonna happen. Your vision's not gonna get implemented. You really need to focus on paying attention to all the small cues. So practically, we need to be curious. These are some questions you might ask in spaces so that you can develop cognitive empathy. You might ask, what is your opinion on X, Y, Z? Can you tell me about your experience with X, Y, Z? What do you think about or what do you feel? Really become so curious of, of the perspectives of those around you. You need to be present and pay attention. If you're not paying attention, you will miss out on the subtle cues, which will enable you to understand whether or not someone is actually on board with what you are presenting, such as that body language example that I shared. Be curious, consider what you know about this person and be willing to learn more. This sounds so simple. And I, I find it really devastating to see the lack of curiosity that we all apply or don't apply into the people around us. I will repeat again, you don't have to agree with someone to respect them. You have to understand them. We all know that respecting one another and being respected is a great thing. You need to be curious to get there. Lastly, once you've asked them a series of questions, repeat, repeat it back to them to show them that you understand. If someone takes the time to be vulnerable and to share, share with you, you need to make sure that you, they know you are on board with what they have said. Repeat back in your own language and it really makes that person feel empowered, which creates trust, which creates a further space for sharing. And also you need to handle any objections. Our society largely sweeps objections, criticism um, and uncomfortable conversations under the rug. If you do that, your vision is at risk. If you do that, and you present your vision and you don't handle objections, you again, you'll walk out of that office with your ego and your vision won't come to fruition because you have not addressed some of the main bottlenecks and concerns that people have. Next, let's look at what it might mean to, to um, influence feelings. And this is where we're speaking about emotional empathy. 
the ability to share the feelings of another person and build emotional connection. This is tough. It requires you to go deeper. It, it requires you to have um, to really connect with the emotion that the other person is feeling. And I'm sure that many of you have been in situations where you felt the uncomfortableness of what's required to apply emotional empathy. Maybe one of your colleagues has lost one of their family members and you feel so uncomfortable thinking about, oh my word, what do I actually say to this person to let them know that I care, but I don't want to like make it awkward and ask a question that I don't really know how to manage. So often we just shy away and we don't say anything at all. And then what happens is that person who lost their family member feels alone. And I just think that's so sad and there's no excuse for that when we can flex this muscle, muscle of emotional empathy, which shows up in our societies and communities in so many different ways. So what would it look like to have emotional empathy? Have the courage to be vulnerable. Many ways you need to be vulnerable. Firstly, with yourself. If you are required to go deeper and to connect with the emotion that you see in the other person, you have to have the level of self-trust and vulnerability to do that. More importantly, if you're trying to get someone to really share their feelings, you can't just ask, how do you feel? You're likely to get a surface level answer. The most effective way to, to understand how someone is feeling is to first share how you're feeling. And it doesn't need to be something negative. It can be something positive too. But if you share from an authentic, brave, courageous space, you create space for psychological safety where the other person can be vulnerable and really share how they are feeling. And understanding how they are feeling enables you to be strategic in terms of how you communicate your vision. Next, you need to listen without judgment. Manage your ego. It's really difficult when someone's expressing their emotions if you disagree with their emotional response to a given situation because you saying, mm, I, would have, I wouldn't have done it that way. You are not this person. We are all individuals and we are all 100% entitled to our emotions. If you're wanting to really understand someone, let them fully express themselves without your opinion in the way. Next, do not interrupt. Now, so many of the, so many of the conversations I've had where I've been around compassionate, empathetic people, and they've really just created a space for me to share. All of a sudden, you find yourself unpacking all kinds of things. And in the process, you yourself can join the dots and come to have a much greater level of self-awareness that aids the, the whole relationship between you and the other person. So don't interrupt. Let the person have the space to express themselves. Next, focus on understanding how and why how this person is feeling and why they are feeling like that. And lastly, you need to take the time to reflect and to find a way to relate. Emotional empathy is hard. I'll say that again, it is hard. It requires a lot more energy than cognitive empathy. And that is why so many of us shy away from it and don't take the responsibility required to actually flex this muscle. It's much easier to say, oh, no, I understand that problem. Um, I don't know why we're still speaking about it. How frustrating is it when someone says that and you're sitting there scratching your head thinking, yeah, you understand it, that's great. But then why are we still speaking about it? It's clearly still a problem. Cognitive empathy only gets you so far. Emotional empathy is what is required to feel of why this problem is of utmost importance. Because only once you feel it can you move to the highest level of empathy, which is compassion, and to take action on a problem. And this is compassionate empathy. How can we influence our actions and the actions of those around us? And as I've just mentioned, we need to go beyond understanding others and sharing their feelings. We actually need to move to take action and help however we can. To be able to express and to lead with compassion, you have to have applied cognitive empathy in understanding others, emotional empathy in feeling with others, 
but more so you need to create this compelling feeling towards taking action. So earlier I asked you, what internally motivates you? Now, when you can understand what internally motivates other people, that's the source. That's what you need to bring into these conversations. How can we do this? Ask the person directly, what can I do to help? You don't have to have all the answers to express compassion. All you have to have is curiosity and the authenticity to show up with integrity and the willingness to be helpful. If they don't have an answer, because perhaps they're dealing with trauma or stress, ask yourself, what helped me when I felt this way? Or what helped somebody I know when they felt this way? Perhaps you haven't experienced being fired, as an example, and your best friend just lost their job. This is something so many people are, are currently grappling with. Try and find someone else who's been through that and ask them, what was it like and how did you get through that period? Because I've got another friend going through it and I'd love to equip myself knowing how I can show up for them. Present options that can be adapted. Do not present solutions as if you know everything. When you present solutions, you can actually end up having a completely counteractive um, impact on the other person because I mean, we've all been in the space where someone says, oh, but why don't you just do this? And you're sitting there thinking, no, that's not what I need. I've actually tried that. And it really didn't work. And the other person sitting there just thinking it's ridiculous that you're still complaining about this thing or you're still sad about this thing. You need to present options which can be adapted based on the individual circumstances. And lastly, you do what you can. I read a really inspiring story about somebody whose colleague lost their partner, their spouse, and they had a two year old child. Now she's a single mother raising a two year old child. And he thought to himself, you know, how can I possibly help this person? Um, I've never been through something as hectic as this. Um, and what he did was ask a few friends, you know, what do you think I can do to help her? And he offered to fetch this child from school once a week. Small act, huge impact. That single mother then had that time back to herself to reflect and heal from everything that had happened, reconnect with her values, reconnect with her courage to show up and live a life that still has purpose to her. You do what you can to help others. We all have the capacity and the responsibility to lead with empathy. No way on this page does it say it's easy but we have the capacity and the responsibility to lead with empathy. I also really like this. A team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. Now, let's think beyond work, put work to the side. Your romantic partner is your team. Your friends are your team. Your family is your team. Your community is your team. Your nation is your team, your world is your team. And we cannot collaborate if we do not trust each other. We cannot be innovative if we do not trust each other. And the biggest problems that exist in the world will only be solved if we can come together, put our differences and our egos aside and learn to trust one another, learn to empathize with one another and understand each other. Not agree with each other, understand each other. So I'd like to close off with my final role model, who is Sadhguru. He is an Indian yogi and author, and he has incredibly inspiring talks and books. He says, yeah, a leader is not only one, so not only on top of the group, they must also be on top of the world within themselves. If they don't do something about themselves, what they do with other people is going to be accidental. And at any moment, the whole thing can collapse on their head. You need to be on top of your life before you try to inspire and manage and lead the lives of others. I think that, you know, if you look at the fact that stress is one of the biggest health risks in the world. Stress should not be one of the biggest health risks in the world. We should not all be stressed. If we took more responsibility for managing ourselves and living a life in alignment with our values and having the courage to show up with integrity, 
and be on top of the world within ourselves, we would all be much more effective leaders for it. We would all be able to respond to life rather than to react to life. So to close off, success really starts with you. You need to become a student. You need to live with purpose and not with passion. You need to take responsibility for your life. You need to live and breathe your vision and you need to lead with compassion. I hope that this has both challenged and inspired you. That was my mission that I set out for, for today. This isn't easy work. It's not going to end after you end this, um, this event or pause this video. You really need to put in the time and the hours and find what matters to you and really commit to living a life that best reflects that. And that's where I'll leave you for today. Thank you. Back over to you, Kapisin. Great, Kristen. Thank you so much. Um, this was a really insightful and inspiring message. And breaking it down in those five key lessons and having those associated role models is so, so useful. Um, and I think that encouragement to really live a life that you are proud of is something that we can do regardless of age, regardless of background, regardless of where you're at in your career. Um, it's something it's never too late to do. So thank you, um, because it's, I guess, events like this that pretty much allow you to pause and think about these important questions. Um, because as you say, we're all just so busy in our day-to-day -day lives. And to actually quote some of the attendees that are here this evening, um, some of them, actually a lot of them have said, um, these questions have been real food for thought. So there we go. That's probably a, a big compliment to you there and, uh, and really appreciate it. And by the way, those books, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and Sapiens, both of those two books, I've read them and they're great. So really do recommend that. Right, um, I think we have a little bit of time still for some Q&A, uh, which is always great. And I can see that we have some good questions coming in. Uh, one of them is to you, Kristen, of course. Um, so on the subject of leadership, success and values, we, you know, we, we talk about these things quite a lot. They sound great. They sound easy when in actual fact they're not, as you've said. And so one of the attendees have, has asked, how is it that you can effectively translate leadership into practice in our day-to-day -day lives? So what small things can we do at a practical level to enact that leadership? You have all sorts of techniques and mindsets um, and all sorts of mindfulness exercises that you can do. Um, a lot of it is, is done in the workplace where uh, you have your employers giving you all sorts of workshops on these things, how to be an effective leader and whatever. But if you look at a more an individual level on how you can practice it as an individual, what sort of suggestions would you have there? Over to you. Mm. That's a great question. And uh, thanks to the person that did submit that. I think it's really important to make these messages hyper practical. I'm going to give you one point to simplify it and um, just to really make it practical. Get out a piece of paper and a pen and write. And do that for an hour. Close the door, pop the headphones in, put on some calming music and have the level of self-respect to pay attention to and express what comes up for you. It is really the only way that you will be able to identify what you value and just by nature of putting it down on paper, you are shining the light on that thing. And by shining the light mm -hmm. makes you have that responsibility and the energy and motivation to then live out that. It's so difficult to say, great, um, I need to apply empathy. I need to do all these great things at work. You arrive at work, it's stressful. You're in a, in a really high pressure meeting and now you're putting on the added pressure to show up with empathy. It's not going to happen. Just start with that one piece of paper and a pen. That would be my most practical advice on that part. Thanks, Kapisin. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, that's it's really helpful. Um, and then another question that has um, come up is you mentioned that it is our generation's responsibility to change the way we are doing things as a society. As a UCT alumni, what skills, be it soft skills or more technical skills, you feel you have developed whilst being a student at UCT? And how has that been helpful in driving projects like Connection Academy, which you're so proud of and, and rightly so, um, and that is really effective, you know, leadership in action? Hmm. Great question. 
Um, so yeah, I will differentiate there between skills and talents. Um, skills are things that you acquire over patience, perseverance and dedication and determination. And talents are things that come naturally to you. So let me briefly speak about talents and then I'll answer your question. Through giving myself time and the self-respect required to get to know myself, I've become aware of what, what my talents are, that I actually am an incredibly charismatic person, that I have a very visual creative mind and so on and so on. And that is what has enabled me to really action and add value with my skill set. It's time to find out what your talents are. It's also difficult to answer those. So ask for feedback. Ask those closest to you. What do you think I'm really good at? What makes me uniquely different? Um, it's difficult to answer what your own talents are because they're normal to you when they're not normal to the rest of the world. Skills. Um, these are things that you've acquired. So as mentioned, I, I studied economics and statistics, and then I went on to fall in love with behavioral economics. I was fascinated by understanding how people behave and think and how we can nudge and influence people's behavior in a positive way. I then changed over to marketing and then did my master's in marketing research. And as I said earlier, I think marketing research taught me to have an approach of formalized curiosity. It taught me the skill set of being able to plow through loads of information and pick out the nuggets and to be able to synthesize those into something that would make sense and add value. And I think the skill that I also learned coming out of university was that you need to be able to take that rich intellectual information and simplify it so that others can understand it. When you have specialized in something, um, I'm sure there's people of different backgrounds here, you need to know that you have specialized in that and not be humble or modest about it. You are a specialist and it is your responsibility to simplify and make it understandable and actionable to other people. Um, so that would be a skill set. Now, how I've carried that skill set into my podcast as an example, I am able to interview people on all kinds of topics. So I've just done a season on mental health as an example. I am not a mental health expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I can come to understand through cognitive empathy and emotional empathy. I can feel with the information that is presented forward. I can synthesize all the different points like I did when I was writing literature reviews. And then I can summarize it into a really nice conversation. And that's why I've started my podcast, because I flourish and feel so alive when I'm talking about things that matter to me and I believe will matter to other people. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my opinion. Find out what your talents are. Don't be modest about them. Be intentional about them and have the responsibility to use them and apply them to your skills that you've gained. Thanks, Capucine. And thanks to the person who submitted that. No, great. And Connection Academy is definitely a a true a true passion project, I would say, of yours. Um, you've done a, a really good job at it. I would encourage those on the call um, if you are interested or even if you're feeling a bit down one day or looking for, for some general inspiration, I definitely would say um, it's a really go to because it's it's very, very good. So thank you, Kristen. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up just because I'm conscious that it's Thursday night and probably everyone's got things to, to do. But it's been really an excellent evening with you, Kristen. Um, we've had obviously a wonderful uh, presentation from you, some really great um, questions that really um, do give food for thought. And so thank you, Kristen, for your time. I certainly found this topic very interesting, as did I think most of us on this call. I would also like to thank our fellow alums who have joined us this evening. If you would like to get uh, more involved um, in the Young Alumni Network here in the UK, please do. We have various ways in which you can contact us. There is a LinkedIn group. So UCT UK Young Alumni Network is what you can search in the tab and you'll find us there. Likewise, there's the email address that you saw on the invite where you can register your name and your interest to then follow up um, on future events that we are going to have uh, next year. So there's various ways in which you, you can stay in touch, which is great. 
Um, so what's left for me to say is on behalf of the UCT alumni relations team based in South Africa and in London, we thank you for your time and hope to see you again at our next event, where we hope to have more venue options aside from our sitting room. Thank you and good night.